Wie wir bereits gehört haben, kann die digitale Transformation die teilweise Verlagerung des Pflegesystems auf das Zuhause erleichtern. Damit meine ich unser Zuhause als Ort des Komforts, unseres persönlichen Ausdrucks und als Ort der Selbstbestimmung. Bleibt dieses Zuhause mit dem Einsatz von digitalen Technologien dann überhaupt noch unser Zuhause? Daraus folgen noch einige weitere Fragen, mit denen sich Sheldon Fitzpatrick im folgenden Video beschäftigen wird. Wer trifft die mit dem Zuhause verbundenen Entscheidungen und wer hat dabei Mitspracherecht? Wie können verantwortungsvollere Ansätze zur Nutzung von Technologie im Pflegealltag aussehen? Und abschließend die wichtigste Frage. Wie können wir durch Technologien Lebensqualität verbessern und älteren Menschen die Unterstützung bieten, die sie tatsächlich benötigen? So in the second chapter, we said that it matters um, for how we think about uh, the who and what we're designing for. And we complemented the view of aging as a decline process with an alternative view, a more holistic view of living longer, living longer and with a focus of quality, whatever that means for that person. And then in the last chapter, we talked about all the different sorts of technologies that are currently being offered or under development for older people in care at home. And we finished noting that despite all the effort and money and um, availability of products, they're really not being widely taken up, nor are they having real impacts on care. So how do we reflect on these? And in particular, what do they say about ageing and the home and care? And what might be some other possible approaches that we could consider? So. What if we just looked, if we were just looking at these technologies alone, we could imagine that they think about ageing primarily as a decline process. They're concerned with more of the assistive support aspects, the, the cognitive and physical problems that have to be solved. All fine. But what would it also mean if we were to pick up on our more holistic notions of ageing? How could we better support living longer and with quality of life by somehow using the technology to help people make their own adaptations and compensations so that they can live as well as they want to. If we were to look at what these technologies say about the home, there's an interpretation you could make that the home's just a convenient and cheaper alternative um, as to the hospital as a space of care because we don't have enough beds in hospital for everyone now. So it's just an extension to the hospital ward. And that might be reflected in the grey devices that we often get installed in, in homes. How might we think differently about technologies if we consider what makes home unique? It's a place where people feel at home. You know, think of that sense of being at home. It's It's comfort, it's your space, you're in control, it's your things, your mess, your aesthetics, your style. Again, reflecting back to that comment that was made about I don't want my home looking like a hospital. A home is a different sort of space. And the older person is usually not the only person living in the home. There are often other people and there are visitors coming and going. We often frame the home as just the, the person in a prison. The individual. Think of the isolation and the, the so-called false alarms because of loneliness. And if we were to look at these technologies for what they say about care, we would think that care only meant the absence of problems or the detection of problems when they happened or the prevention of them. But again, if we took more holistic notions, What would it be if we took well-being seriously? So, and concerned ourselves with not just the physical aspects, but the mental and the social and the spiritual um, health and well-being of the whole person, and how we could use technology, if there's even a role for it, to enhance these areas. Another version of care that we might interpret from the technologies is that. Care is just looking after the medical aspects. If we know what the blood pressure is and the pulse is, that's good enough. 
But what about the very mundane but real practicalities for people of getting through each day as they live with the impacts of, of what's happening with their bodies? And whose agendas do we see driving these solutions? Where does the power lie? Who gets to decide? Should it only be governments and companies and the healthcare system that have a say? And they certainly do need to have a say because they're the ones who are footing the very substantial costs. But if we only talk to them, there's almost an imposed view of patients there doing what they're told and being in that passive being looked after position. What if we also involved older people and their families and their broader informal care community support networks? These are all questions we need to take very seriously. And if we're to take responsibility and accountability seriously in the design of technologies, this is what we, these are the things we have to think about if we're going to end up with systems that really do fit for the people and the context that we're designing for and that people actually find useful and want to use. So how can we rethink roles for technology and how can we approach their design? Francisco Nunes, a researcher who worked with us, talks about this in needing a, a conceptual shift from the design of medicalised self-care technologies to mundane self-care technologies. And that involves shifting from not just the, the medical care processes as the main focus of attention, but also these everyday challenges that we talked about, and having patients not just as instruction followers, but enabling people to be active coordinators of their own care. And I'd argue that this is not a case of either or, but we need both. It's an and case. So how do we account for the realities of the ageing process and the desire to live longer and live well and, and that conceptualisation of ageing? How do we balance the concerns for the formal, governmental, institutional care providers and the concerns of people and their families and friends and informal carers and just living everyday life. For a start, I think the really critical place of where we have to start is gaining much deeper understandings of all the people and organisations involved. So we do still need to talk and with care providers like doctors and nurses and the institutions responsible for care. But more importantly, we need to talk with older people and their family and friends so that we understand what life is really like for them on a day-to-day -day basis and what's important to them, what they care about, what makes a good quality of life for them right now, and have ways of involving them in ongoing you know, idea, ideas and coming up with solutions, not just informants. We can illustrate some alternative imaginations for the role of technologies with a few examples. So imagine someone has fairly limited mobility and not able to get to the shops very easily. We may give them a smart walking cane, great. Um, and we might also think about uh, we can enable online food ordering, mm, but then they might have problems using technology. Ah, oh, so we could just have a smart fridge in a cupboard then that automatically reorders groceries for them. Or we could take a totally different approach and use technology to set up neighbourhood networks and connect neighbours to the older person where the neighbours drop in and they actually see the person and talk with them, find out what they want when they go to the supermarket. And we, we are using technology to both meet a practical need as well as support a really, really important social need, social connection for someone who might otherwise be quite isolated at home. Or let's imagine someone living in one of our smart homes with all of those movement sensors we talked about having around the place. Instead of it turning the home into a prison where they're being monitored, and when we talk to some of our older people, or participants, they would often tell us that one of the things that was really important to them was, and that they loved, was spending time with the grandkids, but often it was hard to get the grandkids to talk or engage, especially remotely. 
So what if we also installed the same sort of technologies in the homes of the grandkids? Oh, and think about your reaction to that, maybe. Um, and enable the grandkids and the grandparents to play a game of virtual hide and seek together. We're still checking in and seeing, checking the safety and security of the older person because we know that they're active and moving, but we're meeting their social needs and their connection needs as well with, with important others. Or let's imagine someone living with Parkinson's disease where they have very serious tremors. Um, Francisco Nunes, who I talked about before, his research talked about how um, the, the medication was really important to managing the tremors and that that's what the doctors would focus on in their consultations with the patients. But the patients um, uh, were much more concerned not just about their medication but just practical things like the challenge of getting dressed in the morning or the problems putting on lace-up shoes. And so the, the value of connecting people here with an online community of other people with Parkinson's where they can share tips and tricks about how to do all those mundane practical things of everyday life. And again, going back to the medications and the smart pill bottle idea, doctors prescribe pills with a strict regime, you know, take this every four hours or six hours and if that's easy to implement in a smart pill bottle and it would send out alerts accordingly. But when Francisco talked to his participants, they got very skilled in just adapting, you know, the adaptations and compensations, adapting the time they took their pills to have maximum effect, say, when they were meeting a friend for lunch. So imagine if we could redesign a smart pill bottle that both helped with reminders according to the schedule set by the doctors, but also more actively supported the person to make safe adaptations to this timing to fit in with what they have to do today. And you might well have lots of other ideas for things that could be done. So what are the key takeaways from all of this? I think the key message is it's not enough just having a good technology that works technically. And we've seen this in both the slow uptake of both telemedicine and the slow uptake of technology for care at home. It's much more than a technical issue. It's complex. It's also social and professional and organisational and political and legal and infrastructural and so on that we've talked about. So I think when we think, and hopefully we think, that's a key point, we think about designing technologies, we think about the fact that we have a responsibility to try to identify and take into account these broader issues for all of the people involved that are needed to put the technology to work practically in everyday life, in everyday medical practices, in everyday homes. And that we hold ourselves accountable to diverse stakeholders, all of the people who will be impacted by and have to use these technologies. And towards getting to more responsible and accountable design of technologies, I invite us all to be mindful about what assumptions are we making about the who and the what? Whose needs are we designing for? What values and qualities are we embedding in the systems? Who's involved in having a say? Whose voice counts? And it's also a good reminder to us all that we can all be more mindful in what technology we accept into our lives and how we can choose to use technology in responsible ways for what is quality of life for us. And we can start doing that now. <laughs>